I've restarted this podcast probably five times recording it because the topic today is a little bit different. I'm going to share with you uh, the journey that I went on as I transitioned from my old job to the online space. Uh, it started for me in 2010, late, early, late 2010, early 2011, and has continued to now. And, and with so many of you now looking at starting that side hustle, possibly leaving the only job that you've known for the last long period of time and dealing with the change, the uncertainty, the trials and tribulations of reinventing yourself. I think it would be a good exercise to revisit those steps and walk you through what I went through and what I experienced so that you can have some context as far as how long it takes and also the emotional journey. The emotional journey was significant. It was far more than I anticipated and hopefully it's, for all of you, it'll be a little bit easier than what I went through. And that's really what this podcast is about, is to, to help us on that journey. So we're going to go in the Wayback Machine and take a look at the, the making of a digital entrepreneur today on Gray Matters. Steve Dotto here. How the heck are you doing this fine day? Welcome to Gray Matters, the podcast for those of us in the gray zone. What is the gray zone? Primarily baby boomers and Gen X, those of us sporting a touch of gray. We're interested in finding our place in the digital age. On this podcast, we will learn about online marketing, community building, social networking, all from our perspective. The world's changing. The job market is not interested in us anymore. We're facing the prospect of a reluctant retirement, and that is not cool. We need a side hustle to take our experience and put it to work for us. We need to develop mad skills, adapt, and evolve in order to remain relevant in the digital age. I can help. This podcast can help. I'm glad you found us. When I uh, did the research for this podcast, I got to admit, I, I didn't enjoy the memories, some of the memories of what I went through as I transitioned from my old job to the new me. Uh, I would do it again, but I would like it to be easier than it was last time. There were some difficult times. There were some difficult times. And so what I'm, so the, the goal today in this podcast is for those of you that are considering transitioning or are in the transition to understand that you're not alone in the confusion and in the uncertainty and in the challenges we face and to give you some sort of a frame of reference of how long it takes to get your feet under you, to feel that you are on the right track in this space and that you're going to be, and that things are going to be okay. I know things are going to be okay, but you don't know that when you're in the middle of it. So let's take a look. It all began for me in 2011. Uh, at the end of 2010, I wrapped up doing my TV show, which I had done for 16 years. And I, I really didn't have an exit plan. I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't that prepared that I knew what I wanted to do next. So I started to do some live events. I still had plenty of speaking engagements, bringing revenue in. I did a radio show, which was a, just kind of a dabbly thing. It wasn't something I was hundred percent committed to. And you can't really make a living off of a radio show these days anyways. But I, I, so I did a kind of a, a few different things as I was kind of trying to figure out what was next. I was trying to discover myself as I was going through this next phase, but here's what I had going for me. I had a massive ego going for me. I had just exited nearly 20 years in traditional media being very successful. So I thought that there was no challenge that I could not overcome because of what a brilliant business person I was. Well, I was brought up pretty short over the next few years as I realized that I wasn't nearly as smart as I thought I was and <laughs> things weren't quite as easy as I figured they would be. So over the next, well, I guess the next three years, it's part of it's part of it's kind of a blur to be honest, because I felt like I was kind of spinning my wheels at times. Uh, but I, 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 I started, I dabbled in a couple of different vertical markets and looked at doing live trainings, teaching people productivity, cause I've been very successful teaching productivity on our, on our TV show. And then in 2013, I was still, I still hadn't yet really come to the point where I recognized that. I was struggling trying to figure out how I was going to reinvent myself, but I wasn't necessarily quite as cocky as I was in 2011. 
and moved to 2013 and a very important moment happened. There was, I was, uh, I emceed a, an awards banquet for social media awards in Victoria, British Columbia. And it was part of a conference called social media camp. The keynote speaker for that particular social media camp was a woman called Mari Smith. You might've heard of her. She is the Facebook queen. Mari is an imposing woman. She is an impressive, uh, uh, personality. She stands well over six foot tall. She's this gorgeous Scottish woman who has an imposing presence. And she was familiar with what I'd been doing on TV. And she looked at me at this, at this dinner and she says, you're doing everything wrong. <laughs> and I said, what? And she says, you should be doing your stuff online. You should be building yourself on the internet and you should be selling online. And I looked at her and went, yeah, right. I don't do that. I don't do this small screen. I was a TV star lady. And I just, at any rate, I, I did chat with her at dinner. And actually it was a very interesting dinner because not only was she there, but Amy Porterfield was also at that dinner just starting out on her career. So, uh, although Amy was quite quiet, she was a little bit shy and, uh, she didn't say too much in Mary's presence is, is, can be, as I say, imposing. Now, I don't know why, but Mari kind of took me under her wing and what she was telling me was fascinating. She was talking to me about the whole world of online marketing and online business, the, the stuff that I am now steeped in and you are interested in by the, uh, by the, into the nature that you are following this podcast. And for some lucky reason for me, she took me under her wing as she was about to do a product launch. She was about to sell a new course on Facebook advertising and she took me in kind of to the inner circle as she was preparing all of the different pieces and launching this course. So over a several month period, I got to learn things that I'd never seen before about mail lists and opt-ins and delivering webinars and sales webinars and sales pages and conversion. And right in front of my eyes, she developed an online course, promoted it through email and webinars and then sold it. And I think it was $197 and hundreds of people were purchasing this course on the day that she launched it. And I was just gobstopped. I went, wow, that is fantastic. And in my, in my hubris, I thought, I think I'd like to do that. And now she'd given me, you know, kind of shown me all of the, all of the pieces of the puzzle, but I didn't know how to do them. But I mean, how difficult could it be? So I thought that's what I'm going to do. I'll make tons of money that way and lay, I'll be on easy street. So I launched a course about four months afterwards myself, and it was a colossal failure. It was called Discover Massive Productivity, DMP. And I thought people would love to learn from me how to be productive, how to use tools like to-do list managers and Evernote and these sorts of tools. And I thought everybody would be interested in this course and I could sell it. I think I tried to sell it for the same price Mari did for $197. And I did all the preparation for this course and I promoted it and I did some stuff on YouTube around it. And, and it was a, it was a, I just laid a big fat egg. I think I sold like 30 copies or maybe 40 copies and I put a lot of work into it and I was devastated because I had no idea what I'd done wrong. I know now, of course, what I did wrong, everything, but then I had no idea what I had done wrong. That was the beginning of my journey. And over the next two to three years, well, for, till 2014. So that's like 2012 now. So for the next two years, I spun my wheels. And if I made a decision, it was the wrong decision as we went along. I just, I just could not do anything right. As far as building a business and selling, I was, I, I knew that this online world had a lot to offer, but I couldn't catch the magic. And I, and I think there's a combination of reasons that I didn't uh, and then a combination of reasons why I did ultimately kind of get on the right track. But that's the, I think that's the most interesting part of the story that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about where I went wrong and how I kind of figured things out this, this journey, because this two year period was incredibly important because you want, you're all going to go through this two year period. Everybody who reinvents themselves is going to go through what I went through. And if you can do it in two months instead of two years, or better yet, two weeks instead of two years, that's my goal. I want you to get through this stage 
as quickly as possible. And this is the learning stage. This is where you understand and you start to learn what your platform is, what your community is, what your value is, all of those pieces that are so important in success in the online space have to become entrenched, have to come into focus for you to move ahead and be successful. So here's, I'm first of all going to tell you where I made some mistakes as I went through this process. The first and biggest mistake I made was getting ahead of myself and deciding what my community wanted to buy before I even really had a community. So I decided that this course, Discover Massive Productivity, would be perfect for my audience, even though I didn't really have an audience, but it would be perfect for them because I could, knew I could teach it really well. And it was really interesting when I told it to other people. When I m mentioned it to friends, they thought, that sounds like a really good course, Steve. That sounds like a great idea. Of course, they are very supportive of me as I'm doing it. And so nobody's going to tell me it's a stupid idea, even if they thought it was. And they haven't told me to this day if they thought it was a stupid idea. Nevertheless, that was my biggest mistake is I jumped ahead of myself and started to produce a product before I was ready. Here's what I did right through that period of time. I published on YouTube. And I didn't publish as frequently as I should have, but I started to publish on YouTube and started to learn what YouTube was all about. And now I know what I did was I began to build my platform. I began to create a voice online that people could respect and cleave to so that I could start building a real following. In April of 2013, I... I made some notes. In April 13, 2013, I had 3,354 subscribers on YouTube. And most of those weren't super active subscribers. They were kind of leftover subscribers from when I'd done the TV show several years before. I hadn't nurtured YouTube at any point. So that was my subscriber base, 3,000 people uh, on YouTube that weren't really committed to me. But that was the starting point. But by publishing over the next year, by the same time, by 2014, that number of subscribers had grown to about 25,000. So I, I grew quite well, I think, for a small, nascent channel that didn't really have an idea of what they were doing on YouTube or how to, how to build a YouTube following. <clears throat> what I did have going for me was I had a good online presence. Uh, from all my years on television, I could do demos really well. And that, in those early days, that carried a lot of weight and people liked my style on air and I was able to slowly develop a presentation technology, a presentation style on YouTube that attracted an audience. The smartest thing I did other than publish fairly frequently over that time and try and grow that list was I had conversations with that list. I listened to what they had to say. I read every YouTube comment. I replied to it. I took to heart what they were telling me. And most importantly, I read between the lines of what they wanted. I started to understand what type of content they wanted and what they were interested in. Now, I didn't realize at that moment, but as I was doing that, that would end up being my salvation because I released, first of all, this productivity course. I did a few other courses. None of them did particularly well. And I was burning through my nest egg pretty quickly. Over the course of the next couple of years, I had pretty much depleted most of my savings to the point where if we now move ahead to 2014, to late 2014, or I guess 2015, I was starting to feel the pinch financially. More than starting to feel the pinch financially, I was actually pretty much out of money. And I had, you know, kind of burned through all of my extra little pools of money, and in August of 2015, I was facing a very dire situation. I didn't have my mortgage payment for October that year. I looked in my bank account. I had all my bills and I didn't have enough money and I didn't have enough billables. This was the key point. I didn't have any speaking gigs booked. I didn't have any income coming in. And I actually didn't have money to pay two months down the road for my mortgage. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was desperate. I was, and this the drain on my resources was financial, but it was also emotional because this is, this is the, this is the difficult part to talk about. And I think this is a really important part for baby boomers to understand because we've been successful. And when you go through 
a prolonged period of struggle and you haven't been successful for a little while, it starts to prey on your confidence and your happiness and your sense of well-being. And I had reached the point, even though I'd, the YouTube channel had grown, but I wasn't making money and I didn't know how to make money. And I was, it had affected me to the point that I actually had to go to the doctor and say, I need some help. I can't find my happy place anymore. And I ended up on antidepressants for a period of about eight months, which is the only time in my life. I've always had little issues with depression as we all have, but it was always seasonal. It was always based on the, based on my, the cycle of delivering my TV show or to being on, on stage in a show, the intense amount of work and camaraderie and, uh, energy that goes into it. As I finish each project, I would always have a couple of weeks that I was really down in the dumps and then I would slowly pick up my socks and I would go on for the next thing. And so it was, it was, it was very, it was, it was never anything that scared me. For the first time in my life there in 2014, I was scared that I was dealing with a medical depression and I couldn't solve it myself. So I turned to some help. I, 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 I took medication for a period of time and that helped set an equilibrium, but my sense of well-being still wasn't there because I didn't have the confidence that I could have success. The conversations and dialogue that we had with the with my community led me to the point that I understood that Evernote was a product that they were really interested in. Every time I posted a video on Evernote, it did very well. The numbers were higher. And when I people asked questions about Evernote, they were responsive. And uh, when I posted answers, they were responsive to that. And I recognized that my community was really interested in this product and that was something that could work for them. So I kind of took one last desperate gamble. I said, I was actually telling Shannon at the time, if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to go get a job. I'm going to have to go get a real job with somebody. And I hadn't worked for anybody for 30 years and I was terrified of the prospect of getting a job and I had no idea what I was going to do, but I was actually starting to put together a resume and looking at, I'm going to have to try and find a job. But we were on holidays that year in August and I wrote a course for Evernote. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do everything exactly the way Mari did the first time. I'm going to go back to basics. I'm going to launch this course. And when I got back from holidays, I launched with a three webinar series in September. And I launched a course at $97. I priced it very aggressively. And I called it Evernote Made Easy. It was a 10 part course. And I needed to earn, I think, $6,000 in order to cover my expenses to be comfortable and to know that I kind of could make it through to the next series of billings that I had, which was some, a speaking series that I had coming up. But this was really important. This was not insignificant. This was make or break time for me. And I was very anxious when we launched the course, when I created the sales page myself. I did everything myself because I had no, no support network at the time. So I created the sales page. I created all the materials. I launched the webinar and we sold, I think we sold a hundred copies in the first five days, which was roughly $10,000 in sales. And I can remember, I actually, I actually shed a tear. I actually wept a little bit as the sales started coming in and I recognized with an amazing wave of relief that I was going to be able to make my mortgage payments and support my family for the rest of the year. And I can't, even now I kind of get a little bit emotional when I think about this, this moment, because so much of our pride, so much of our sense of self-worth is taking care of those around us. And for the first time in my life, I saw a path that I wasn't going to be able to take care of my family the way that I wanted or myself even. And that was terrifying. That was sobering to me. Um, but it didn't happen that way. The course was successful literally at the 23rd hour of the day <laughs> of, of the, uh, of the journey, things worked out and I learned some powerful lessons from delivering that course. And from that point on, we've had, you know, we've, we've, we began the steady climb back to where, you know, what I would consider we have a successful venture. Um, but when you burn through all of your assets like that and you kind of have two years of very low income, um, it takes a long time for you to kind of recover. And it's been a, it's been a long journey. 
But you've now facing the same crossroads that perhaps I faced in 2010, 2011, when you are now looking at reinventing yourself and coming into a, in, 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 in coming in generating an income or a living from an unknown, maybe not, you've always had a paycheck in the past and now you're going to be relying on entrepreneurial revenues. When you face that crossroads, you are going to face a series of challenges that you can't anticipate. Some of you will find it a very easy transition and others will go through the kind of journey that I went through over that several year period. I would like to think that as a result of the type of content that we have available to teach us now and the number of people that have blazed a trail in this space that things should be easier. You should not have to go through all of the uncertainty and all of the challenges and all of the discovery that I had to go through or that I did go through as I began this journey. I consumed as much content as was available to me. I took courses, I talked to other content creators. I learned, I, I had mentors like people like Mari who were great mentors, but there's still a, there's still the fact that every one of us who goes on this content creation journey that becomes a content creator, a digital entrepreneur, every one of our businesses is going to be unique in many ways. There is no blueprint for us all to follow. There's a framework for us all to follow. Understanding that you need a platform, that you're going to be working in a social network, that you're going to be communicating with your audience, that you're going to be having a dialogue with them, that they will lead you to the content that's most compelling and interesting to them, that you're going to have to discover what the revenue triggers are, where you can make money on this, that you're going to have to find the balance between what you give away and what you sell, that you're going to have to determine what type of sales you're going to be doing, whether it's uh, you know, whether it's an online course, whether it's a community, whether it's speaking, whether it's a book, you're going to have to find your own revenue models and your own business model out of the framework that we all work in, which is content creation, essentially building community and building a platform. That's the journey that we all go on. Do I think it's going to take most of you two years? I certainly hope not. My prayer is that it's not. This podcast is dedicated to making it so it's not a two-year journey for you. But regardless if it's two months or six months, a year or two years, you are going to go through the emotional roller coaster that I went through. It might be just shortened. I guess the message of this particular episode, and why it's a little bit of a different episode, is that you have to have faith that you will find your way through this if you enter it with purpose, with determination, and with clarity. And the fact that your preconceived notions aren't always going to be the answers, that you're going to have to be flexible as you go through the journey and make changes when they're warranted. The other thing that I'm really going to encourage each and every one of you to do is make sure you've got a support network that understands not only you as an individual, where your family is going to give you that support, but a support network of other people that are on the same journey, other content creators that understand the challenges that we face in the online world that we face and that you can explain to them what you're going through and that they can give you, at least they can reflect back to you that you're probably in better shape than you realize and they can give you some context as you go along. I think that trusted advisors as we go through this entire process is one of the most valuable assets that you can have. So making sure that you're going to the conferences, that you're engaging in the community forums, that you're discussing with others. I see often in the YouTube channel, uh, in, in, in my vlog, I see often the community members having conversations with each other, talking to each other about the challenges that they face and commenting on each other's comments and then getting and engaging in conversations. And it warms my heart. It absolutely, actually, I get a big smile on my face when I see that engagement happening. I absolutely love that. And I think that that is the sort of reaction and the sort of benefit that I really hope that we all get from being part of this, the gray zone by being, uh, by supporting each other as we move ahead. So that's it. It's a little more of a modeling podcast today, a lot more personal sharing than I'd probably planned when I first began Gray Matters. 
but I think it's a story that's worth visiting. And I wanted to get it out there early because I know with 14,000 people in North America retiring each and every day, how many people are starting on the journey that I started on in 2011? And how many people are struggling with that journey that I started on in 2011? And how I'd like to be able to just reach out to all of those who are struggling with that journey and tell them that there is, uh, that, that the, the road is difficult at times, but it's worth traveling. So that's it for this week. Looking forward to your comments. If you are enjoying this podcast, if you're finding value in it, make sure that you give us a star rating review on whichever podcast platform you happen to be on. And if you want to comment, if you want to engage in the dialogue, I encourage you to visit our website at dottotech.com forward slash gray nine is the, this episode. This is forward slash gray nine at dottotech.com and that's G R E Y nine. And there we've got a discussion forum. We've got a, we've got co- comments on the blog post for each and every podcast episode. And I encourage you to move all of the conversations into that forum there. Till next time, I'm Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle.